Sutra. They clearly understand and know that all that is worldly is like a marriage, like light and like reflections, like an echo and like a dream, like an illusion and like a transformational changes. In that way, they are caught with and they enter. The locations of practice of all Buddhas, they accomplish the wisdom of universal worthy and universally deeply illumine the Dharma realm. They live far behind defined attachments to living beings and worlds, yet expansive is their great compassionate mind to purify all that is worldly. The Bodhisattvas are always properly mindful, discussing the lion's wondrous Dharma. They are purified just like empty space, yet they establish great expedient means. They see worldlings as ever confused and upside down, and so resolve to rescue and cross them over. What they practice is all completely pure, and they universally pervade all Dharma realms. If seen in their actuality, all Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, Buddha Dharmas and worldly Dharmas are completely undifferentiated. Commentary, they clearly understand and know that all that worldly is impermanent, without self, suffering and empty, and is like a marriage. It's seen as existing from afar, but when approached, it isn't there. It's also like light which has no actual substance, and like reflections which aren't real either, like an echo and like a dream like an illusion which has no truth to it, and like transformational changes which are also, which are also forms. In that way, they, the, Bodhisattva, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are caught with, and, and they enter those kinds of states all the while understanding that they are not real. As he said, if one sees a phenomena and awakens to them, one transcends the world. If one sees phenomena and is confused by them when falls into the mundane will. You should think in that way and not be attached to any dramas and sweep away all dramas, be free of all marks. To be without attachment is the Dharma draw cultivated by all Buddhas. They, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, accomplish the great wisdom of universal worthy Bodhisattva and so they universally deeply illumine to the exhaustion of empty space and the Dharma realm. They leave far behind defined attachments to living beings and worlds. If you have any, you should get free of them. You have to put down what you can't put down and renounce what you are unable to give up. What you can't bear, you have to bear, and even much more you must yield what you can't yield. Yet, expansive is their great compassionate mind. Compassion blocks out suffering. Kindness bestows happiness. They pull living beings out of suffering and bestow happiness upon them to purify all that is worldly so that all worlds become pure. The Bodhisattvas are always properly mindful and never as selfish or have thoughts of benefiting self. All they have is that proper thought discussing the lion's wondrous drama, the only one to propagate the Buddha drama and teach and transform living beings. They, the Bodhisattva's minds, are purified just like empty space, yet they establish great expedient means. They always are raising up thoughts of great expedient skill in means. They, the Bodhisattvas, see worldlings, all of us living beings in the world, as ever confused and deluded upside down, and so resolve to rescue and cross them over the sea of suffering so they'd be saved. What they, the Bodhisattvas, practice is all completely pure without defilement, and they universally pervade all Dharma realms, extending to every location. All Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, Buddha Dharmas and worldly Dharmas, if seen in their actuality, all have no discriminations to them. From the point of view of truth, all of those aspects are not differentiated at all. Sutra, the third common's treasury of the Dharma body, universally enters the world. Although it is present in the world, 
towards the world it has no attachments just as reflected images do not come or go within clear pure water you should notice just the same way with the Dharma body as it pervades the world with such a freedom from defilement and attachment the body and walls are both pure still and clear just like empty space and all things do not have production they know the body does not have an end is without production and without extinction neither permanent nor without permanence as is manifest throughout all worlds they dispel all deviant outlooks and open up proper views the Dharma nature does not come or go and does not attach to a self or what belongs to a self commentary the thirst commas treasury of the Dharma body the Tathagata's Dharma body universal enters the world and is not apart from it although it the Buddha's Dharma body is present in the world towards the world it has no attachment it's not like we living beings in the world who are attached to this world to this body of mine and to all of my possessions although the Buddha pervades the world nonetheless he has no attachment to anything just as reflected images do not come or go within clear pure water by way of analogy when there is something that can be reflected the image appears in water that's pure and when there is nothing to reflect there is no image yet it is certainly not the case that the reflected image come into the water nor do they depart from the water and so you should know it is just the same way with the Dharma body which is like the reflected image as it pervades the world which is like the clear water the same principle applies with such freedom from defilement and attachment we should get free from defined attachments and not linger and crave and forget to return thinking this world is a land of happiness and a pleasure spot is not don't be defined by attachment to this world and then the body and walls are both pure still and clear just like empty space and all things do not have production they the buddhas and bodhisattvas know the body does not have an end they realize there is neither an end to the body nor to end no end to the body why not it's because they have been certified to patience with the non-production of dharmas to the buddha's dharma body which is uh, without production and without extinction since it is not produced how could it be destroyed there has to be production for there to be extinction since there is no production there is no destruction and so it is neither permanent nor without permanence for it to be permanent would be the doctrine of permanence and for it to be without permanence would be the doctrine of annihilationism but the principle of the buddha drama is that of neither permanence nor annihilationism neither being nor non-being neither existence nor non-existence the buddha's drama body is that way as is as it manifests throughout all worlds they dispel all devon outlooks all devon knowledge and devon views held by living beings and open up proper knowledge and proper views on the path of beings the Dharma nature does not come or go or does not attach to a self or what belongs to a self Sutra this is as a master magician makes appear all kinds of things which do not come from anywhere nor go to any place the illusion's nature neither has limits nor is it without limit yet in the midst of the great cloud three manifest limits within the limitless using the, this mind of still samadhi they cultivate all wholesome roots that produces each and every buddha and is neither limited nor without limits both having limits and not having limits are entirely nothing but false thoughts in understanding and penetrating every destiny they are not attached to limits or no limits the deep profound drama of all buddhas in vast most still and tranquil 
with the depths of limitless wisdom. They know the profundity of all destinies. The Bodhisattvas leave confusion and inversion. The purity of their minds is continuous. They cleverly, with the powers of spiritual penetrations, cross over living beings without the need. Commentary. This is as a master magician makes appear all kinds of things, conjuring up all sorts of states which do not come from anywhere nor go to any place. The states conjured up are all false and empty and so did not come from anywhere or go anywhere. The illusion's nature neither has limits nor is it without limits. Yet in the midst of the great crowd, three manifest limits within the limitless. Even though the nature of the illusions conjured up by magic doesn't have limitations of measure or amount, still it appears to the crowd to be measured and also to be without measure of mouth. Using this mind of still samadhi, they cultivate all wholesome roots that produces each and every Buddha. If you cultivate all good roots, that when your cultivation reaches completion, you become a Buddha, and this is also something which is neither limited nor without limits. Both having limits and not having limits, having numerical measure or not, are entirely nothing but false thoughts. They only exist due to discriminating false thoughts on the part of living beings. In fundamental still creations, there are no such discriminations. In understanding and penetrating every destiny, they are not attached to limits or no limits. This clear understanding and exhaustive penetration of all destinies includes all living beings, each type having its own grouping. Living beings of the same type group together, as he said, the good make a company and the evil from a troop. People seek out people who are like them. Gangsters from relationships with other gangsters and military men become friends with others of limitary of the limitary. Left home people are companions with other left home people and lay people from friendship among themselves. Students befriend students and elderly are friends with one another. They each gather according to their kind cats like to trace mice and mice like to go into caves and steal things to eat. Ants assemble with other ants and day after day they are very talented in providing for their mouths and stay incredibly busy at it. Mosquitoes from morning to night think about drinking the blood of other living beings. Each relies on its own destiny and each has its own nature. Red peppers are hot Golden seal is bitter, watermelons are sweet, each has its own flavor. We people are not aware of it, but right among humans, there are all kinds of differences. People who like the same sort of thing congregate together. Take a look at how a strip tease houses, no one wears clothes. They are just that kind of destiny, that kind of person. If you look around a bar, you see the people all holding their glasses and drinking without concern for their lives. They would feel comfortable if they drank themselves to death. They're just people same kind. People who like to drink cola ascend to the heavens if they see cola. And people who like to drink milk become ecstatic as soon as they see milk. They drink an entire gallon at one sitting, and after that they have to go to the toilet several hundred times. If it weren't for liking to drink, how could such trouble arise of having to go to the toilet that many times? It's from excessive liking. It's a case of too much being equivalent to not enough. If you go too far, you end up deficient. So it's the same if you had drunk, uh, you hadn't drunk at all. You feel it's nourishing to drink milk, and so you drink more. But as it turns out, you can't retain it, and it runs out. You drink it in from the top, and it runs out the bottom, and none of the vitamins and other nutrients are retained. You have to admit that too much being the same as not enough. 
although it's a small matter in everything you must accord with the middle way and not go overboard if you go too far you have trouble you have trouble there's a proper saying concerning eating fine food which illustrates this principle it goes the less you eat the more you taste for the flavor the more you eat the more your life suffers for it you can taste the flavor of the food if you eat it sparingly but if you eat too excess you'll ruin your stomach and nothing will taste good and don't think that tea is such a fine thing that you want to drink it every day. If you drink tea day after day for a long time, you could develop cancer from it. It's the same as with smoking cigarettes. Don't think drinking a lot of tea is all that good. In everything you do, you should find the middle way or else it won't be wonderful. If you are in accord with the middle way, then it is wonderful. So the Buddhas and Bodhisattva understand and penetrate all the destinies. For example, they know that dogs start to bark as soon as they see someone and that they got the, the dog. Is that dogs have that nature in common? The same principle applies to people. People who don't like to follow the rules have that kind of disposition. Whereas those people who like to cultivate that have that kind of disposition. That's, there's nothing strange about it. What in this world is strange? Nothing. It's not just the way it is. If there are lots of people in the world, then it gets complicated. So there's nothing worth being astonished at. Everything is just every very ordinary and usual. Everything's okay. It's just that principle. What's so strange? An incense burner is just for people to light incense in. It simply has that use. The Buddha is receiving the incense smoke, not doing anything else. If you do, if you understand that, then what is odd? What is so incredible? There's no need to say more. If you are going to understand, you've already understood. And if you're not going to understand, it doesn't matter how much I say, you still won't. They are not attached to limits or no limits. Each flops with its own kite. What point is there in becoming attached to this being this way and that being that way? All things are just that way. All between heaven and earth to the exhaustion to empty space and the domarium is just supposed to be. So those of you within the city of 10,000 Buddhas, if you want to follow the rules, then follow the rules. And if you don't want to follow the rules, then don't follow the rules. You could say that the city of 10,000 Buddhas has no rules. How can there be rules when everything's okay? Just provided you're not afraid of falling into the house, then you can commit murder, arson, or sexual misconduct, or lie, or take intoxicants. But if you don't want to fall into the house, then don't so do those things ultimately it's up to you. So, the Bodhisattvas aren't attached to limits, to numbers or not numbers. For example, when I first started lecturing in San Francisco, there were three who came to listen to the lectures. One sat to listen, one reclined to listen, and one listened while asleep. But I didn't pay any attention and just decided what counted was from them to listen, no matter how they did it. The one who reclined would place one foot on the ground and one on the table like a Tai Chi trance dance, very presumptuous. Then in time, there came more people one by one, so there were four, five, six, seven, eight, and now there are over 40. In America, everyone is incredibly busy. Each person has their own livelihood and no one has time to listen to your lecture sutras, especially if you lecture in Chinese and no one knows what you're saying. No one comes. In New York, they hold lectures on the sutra only once a week, but still only 20 or so people attend. It's that way in each of the way places. 
and in Hawaii there aren't many either, nor in San Francisco. So you could say the largest number of people is here in the city of 10,000 Buddhas and Gold Mountain Monastery in San Francisco. Here we have lectures daily. Whatever the weather, we lecture sutras. Uh, whatever the weather, we lecture sutras and speak dharma. So we could say the city of ten thousand Buddhas has more people than any of the other places in the United States. And you could say that here we are panning for gold in sand. The speaking of Dharma pours out like water flowing every day, and we don't pay attention if people come to listen or not. Yet, there are more people who show up day by day. The deep, profound, and wonderful Dharma of all Buddhas is both vast and great as well as fine and subtle, more still, tranquil, and with the depths of the meatless wisdom which all Buddhas have. They know the profundity of all destinies. They know about the destinies of all living beings, each with their own natures, each with particular things which they like, and each with what they seek. If you can reach the point where you seek nothing, then you have no worries. Only the bodhisattvas are able to leave confusion and inversion, confusion by sex, by anger, by intoxicants, and confusion by wealth. Intoxicants, wealth, sex, and anger are the causal factors for people being upside down and deluded. But the bodhisattvas have none of that, and the purity of their minds is continuous. Their minds are always pure, they never have false thinking, and they never become afflicted. When the mind stops and thinking ceases, that is true wealth and honor. When private desires are cut off, that is the true field of blessings.